Let us pray together. Lord, in the midst of the many things that are going on in our minds this morning, and in our hearts, our circumstances, and our relationships, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would draw us to yourself. That you would open our hearts and our minds to your presence. We confess to you, O oh Lord, that we need you to come and help make sense of what it is that we are going through. That we might know how to live and how to receive the love and the mercy that you long to give us. And so we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. There are times when I look at the scriptures and I get really excited. I'm looking forward to what I want to say, and the words come very, very easily. There are other times, and this is one of those mornings, where when I read the scriptures and I read the liturgy that's surrounding it, I think, oh my gosh. Um, because these are incredibly challenging passages. Um, and Cranmer, in his prayer, the Collect, throws down the gauntlet right away. When he says, O oh Lord, you have taught us that without love, whatever we do is worth nothing. It's pretty black and white, isn't it? And it gets, it gets worse, actually. That without which, meaning love, whoever lives is accounted as dead before you. If you want scriptures that actually sort of build up your self-affirmation, these are not those passages. <laughs> But they're not meant to, you see. They're meant to bring us to the point to where we're willing to say, God, I don't understand this stuff at all. It actually does not make sense to me. It's the echo of the line in, first, in the first Corinthian reading where he says, if you think that you're wise in this age, you should actually become fools so that you could become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. That's definitely not how we think, is it? In fact, we're, we're quite impressed with educational accomplishments, PhDs and the like. And yet these passages fly in the face of all of that kind of logic because we admire accomplishment. And in some ways, it's well-deserved. But Jesus is trying to get at something very, very different than accomplishment. And it's sister, self-sufficiency. In fact, what Jesus is actually trying to do in this passage of Scripture is bring us to our knees, where we confess, Jesus, part of me thinks you're just nuts. I don't know how to do this. And I don't know that I know very many people who do. And yet, you're clearly talking about a kind of love that I don't understand, and perhaps I've never even experienced. So that it really does appear to me as foolishness. That doesn't mean I'm not willing to learn. But you need to know that, in essence, that's what I'm bringing to the table as I hear these lessons. I want you to know God likes that kind of honesty. You don't have to pretend. We, we do have church services, don't we, where we hear these passages. They're outrageous at times, just like this morning. And yet we, we, we keep this very kind of pious facade. Well, wasn't that really lovely? <laughs> And everybody smiles and is nice and we enjoy each other's company. But we don't wrestle with the very almost terrifying nature of the scriptures. And, and we can't be allowed to do that. Annie Lamont, I'm sorry, Annie Diller has this very famous passage where she talks about, she says, you know, I don't understand all the people who come to church and they're always dressed so nicely and they smile a lot. When we should be coming to church, we should be handing out crash helmets. Anything could possible when the divine breaks through. In other words, Jesus is intentionally trying to challenge the way we understand, in this case, the very nature of what love is. Remember, that's where Cranmer starts us. Without love, 
We're not worth anything. In fact, without love, as she says, we're counted as dead before God. Well, I know how to be nice to people. I know how to care about people who care about me most of the time. Right? Come on, nod your head. <laughs> but this kind of love, the love that actually is committed to the well-being of my enemies, because that's really what the passage is talking about. I'm all for retribution. <laughs> so Lord, I, I, and here's the point. I need you to teach me something that I just confess to you I don't know a lot about. In other words, the scriptures are so high in what it is that they describe. I mean, in case you didn't catch that, even the last line of the gospel that should have sent us almost running out of the room. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, I guess I quit, huh? I can't do that. And you see, that's actually the point. Jesus is describing something to us that is in fact very characteristic of God. Very uncharacteristic of us. Because you see, the, the kind of love that Jesus describes is in fact exactly how God deals with with us. Because, you see, if, if we understand who we are, we who live in a world deeply committed, for example, to retribution, except when it comes to us, and then we say, oh God, I know I might be guilty, but I need you to let me out of this one. I need your forgiveness. I, I need your mercy. And, and the wonder of it is, is that God, in fact, does forgive. In other words, God himself, as he deals with us, does not live by an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. And in fact, just the opposite. He gives us again and again and again everything that we do not deserve out of his sheer and merciful love for us. That if we were to look at our behavior by the standard of the scriptures, not by the standard of what's culturally right and acceptable. That's not even the playing field we're talking about. The, as God defines it, then we would agree with Paul's description of who we are outside of Jesus acting almost as his enemies. Not, certainly, if what Jesus is telling here is the very character and nature of God, we're acting in contradiction to his nature all the time, at one level or another, even if, even if it never comes out of our mouth. I mean, have you ever had somebody, like you're on the highway, and they're breezing past you at 90 miles an hour, terrifies you, you think this person's going to cause an accident, and then you're, about five minutes later you see them and the police have pulled them over. <laughs> and what do you think? Serves them right. right? <laughs> I think Jesus' response is more like, Oh God, please protect them and get them off the road before they hurt somebody. It, it's, a, it's a different kind of response. And, and what I'm trying to say is that that's his response toward us. You see, the Christian life is to be different from others in that it draws its inspiration, I'm reading a quote now, not from the norms of society, but rather from the very character of the God that we see in Jesus. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. He understands better than any of us the impossibility of what he's being asked. But he's trying to teach us something. Yes, by a certain level of hyperbole. The fact that this is in fact the character of God. This is how God deals with you and with me. That instead of retaliation, what does God offer me? He offers me forgiveness. Instead of justice, what does he offer me? He offers me compassion. Instead of, you're not going to do what I want, therefore I'm just going to blot you off the planet. That kind of self-focus, no, no. What we see in Jesus is just the opposite. Self-sacrifice. He could have at any moment during his life called as the scripture, as you know, it's a gospel song, 10,000 angels. He didn't have to go to the cross. Even remember the wonderful line before Pilate, he said, you couldn't do anything unless it were given to you from above. 
He understands who's in charge, but he willingly submits to what happens to him because he has something greater in mind, and that is literally our salvation accomplished by his death and resurrection. Therefore, he willingly suffers the injust injustice of both the Jewish religious system and the Roman judicial system for the sake of dying on the cross on our behalf. It's a scandal, if you really think about it. It's a scandal. But it has everything to do with, as the writer of Hebrews says, who for the joy that was set before him, meaning to be in fellowship with us, yes, endured the cross, ignored the shame of it, and is now seated in authority at the right hand of God. In other words, Jesus here is describing first and foremost God's character and God's actions toward us. We are the ones who continue to receive as I said, forgiveness instead of retaliation, compassion instead of justice, and self-sacrifice instead of self-centeredness. And if you at least can begin to grasp that, then perhaps it takes us to the next place, which is to say, Lord, I need you to turn my heart, because I don't know how to love like that. And in fact, my mind is filled with all kinds of what-ifs, fearful what-ifs, if I were to live such as this. They're like phantoms in my mind, demons that haunt me, should I live with such compassion, generosity, and self-sacrifice. But you see, Jesus conquered the demonic. He is, in fact, willing to build in us a different kind of fortitude. Not a fortitude based on self-preservation, but a fortitude based on the choosing to walk with compassion and with sacrifice and with mercy. He can give it to us. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus literally can come into these cold, dark, self-centered hearts of ours and pour into us a new kind of light a life that actually lives in a gratitude to God for His love, and out of that serves other people willingly, and sometimes at great personal cost. And you know, if you ask people who live like that, boy, you give a lot. You know what the universal answer is? is? Oh, it's nothing. Not, not in comparison to what God has given me. And that's exactly right, you see. Because this kind of love is in fact the fruit of the understanding that I'm the recipient of just this kind of love. How in the world could I do anything less? Even though I do often. That's what we're being invited to because you see that is the kind of love that Cranmer refers to in the college. It's that kind of love that God wants to put in our hearts. We have a lot of congregations who know how to be nice to each other. We don't necessarily have a lot of congregations that are learning, wrestling with, asking God to help us demonstrate the kind of love that is being described in this passage because we throw it as impossible out of hand and therefore want nothing to do with it. We say it's ridiculous. It puts you in a place of tremendous danger, in fact. And after all, if you really gave in the way that's being described here, you'd just go bankrupt. People would take advantage of you. And part of that's true. You see? Part of it. So what we're saying here is we're being invited into a different kind of life. A life that most of us know very, very little about. A, a life that I know very little about. But I know enough to know that what is being described here is in fact how God deals with me every single day without exception. And therefore, how can I do anything other than say, work this, O oh God, in me? that's beginning to happen, then we're on the road into which Jesus is inviting us to actually be his 
followers. And that's the point of the passage. To come and be a follower who knows that he or she doesn't know very much, but is willing to be a learner and to enter into a very different kind of life. Let us pray again. Gracious Lord, you demonstrated love, this very love, in the way that you dealt with your enemies, in the generosity that you showed the undeserving, and in compassion that is, for many of us, more than confounding. We do pray that you would open up our hearts to that love that kind of mercy, that we might not merely be its recipients, but its channels, that the world might know that Jesus is in fact alive, because he is living and acting in and through us. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen.